Okay, so hi everybody. Um, good day. I'm Matt Reinzak. I'm Aaron's network operations manager, and I'm going to talk about IPv6 implementation at Aaron. Uh, basically, how we did this, and when we did it, and problems we encountered, successes we had, things like that. Um, I'm really curious how many people were in John's presentation an hour ago. Um, Okay, looks like a lot of you were. He covered a lot of IPv6 history and things like that. So I'm not going to get into that. I'm just going to assume that you know what IPv6 is and what it does and that you probably need to look into getting it soon. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to pretty much skip this slide. I think uh, one thing that's worth mentioning though is IPv6 is still in development. There have been several updates in the last 10 years that are worth knowing about and worth reading about. Most of them are related to security or uh, routing table bloat and growth issues. Um, so you can go back and look at this slide later on in the conference materials and give you some good reading material. I also wanted to mention uh, this is kind of my little anecdote for this presentation. What happened to IPv5? And John hit it at this during his presentation, but there, there's really kind of a bigger bit of trivia here. It's not just IPv5. There were a bunch of different versions of IP when they were developing the next generation um, after IPv4. IPv5 was a streaming protocol. It was developed, I think, by BBN originally, but it was Apple, IBM, Sun. A bunch of people looked at it in the 90s. This is before IPv4 had things like QoS and other things that made multimedia really possible. The streaming protocol was thought of as the answer to doing any sort of real-time multimedia stuff, whether it be voice or video or whatever. And eventually, because of QoS and other features in V4, especially you know hardware that really didn't suck, it, uh, it kind of fell by the wayside. Um, but it hints at kind of a bigger thing. There were actually IPv, you know, there was IPv7, IPv8, IPv9. There are actually two different versions of IPv9. Um, two I reference here, and one of them never had an RFC because it was developed by the Chinese and it never really saw the light of day. Uh, they, I know that it had 256-bit addresses, so it abs had absolutely just huge headers, and the argument was is that IPv6 wasn't big enough. Um, if you heard John's presentation, uh, you know, he compared the golf ball to the sun sort of thing. Um, there's a lot of v6 addresses, and the danger of running out is, is pretty minimal, um, at least during our lifetimes. So maybe, you know, some other generation's problem. Um, so here's the uh, timeline for implementing IPv6 at Aaron. We started really thinking about it in 2002. Uh, V6 was pretty much finalized and I guess deployed in 1999. The, the RFC came out in the December of 98 and I think the IAB, part of the IATF, they ratified it in the spring of 99. So in a way we were a little bit behind. You know, we, we looked at things. We uh, you know, want to see if this, if this was something we could do. I know that RIPE-NCC, which is the European counterpart to Aaron, they had already done this. I think APNIC had done it. And we really wanted to get on, on the bandwagon and do, our, do it ourselves. Uh, so we started planning for this. And as you can see, we've deployed, well, six, five IPv6 networks um, throughout my time at Aaron anyways. And really, these days, we're standardized on dual stack. We do v6 everywhere. And I'll explain that as we go through this timeline. The first network we set up was a little standalone stub network. Uh, it was based on the Sprint T1 circuit. We used a Linux box with a Sangoma T1 card. Um, we actually had Cisco routers that could do V6. Uh, they, Cisco's have been doing V6 for a long time now. And I, I'm not completely sure I remember the rationale for why we chose a Linux router other than it was kind of cool. Um, I remember that we had, to, we had to actually hack the Sangoma T1 drivers to get them to work with V6. And Sangoma was actually pretty thankful for that. We gave them the code back, and I think that they used it for a while while they were doing this. It really helped us with troubleshooting, um, and I think that was kind of serendipity. We didn't intend for that to be the case, but having TCP dump and other things like that directly on a router was really, really helpful at this time to figuring out how things were breaking, and things were breaking a lot, actually, at this time. Um, we used an OpenBSD firewall. I can't speak highly enough for OpenBSD in, in this kind of situation. Its support for V6, even back in 2002 and 2003, was exceptional. Um, you know, full state in V6, the ability to combine V4 and V6 rules together, it, it's really, really good. We use it to this day. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with OpenBSD as a firewall, but you know, CARP and all this stuff, it just rocks. Um, and it supports V6 really, really well. Another feature that it has that is really nice when implementing a, a V6 network or any sort of experimental network like this is its ability to log drop, drop packets directly to PCAP files so that you can look at them in TCP dump basically in real time. This also proved invaluable as we were tuning our rule set trying to figure out 
what the right thing to do was because we were really worried about security when we did this. Um, it was one of the reasons why this was a segregated network. We didn't do dual stack. We were really afraid of somebody's, you know, stack smashing attacks, the ping of death. I don't know if people remember the 90s, um, around 95 or 96, somewhere around there, there was the infamous ping of death that one packet could down, well, pretty much the entire internet for a while there. Um, it affected everything from routers to Unix boxes to Windows boxes, just about everything. We were really worried about that. So we, com we kept this network completely separate. Um, we deployed our website on it. Um, however, we did not have a quad A for www.aaron.net at this time. We used v6.aaron.net. Um, we had a DNS server and an FTP server. Uh, Aaron has a big FTP site that hosts a lot of the Aaron zones, um, a lot of statistical information about the IP addresses that we allocate. You can go there anonymously and look around. There's actually all sorts of interesting historical information on there. In a way, it reminds me of like FTP.uu.net from way back when. It has just tons of stuff on there. It's interesting to go explore. Um, issues we had with this network had a lot of path MTU issues. Um, basically, what, what that means most of the time is, is that somewhere there's a tunnel on the network, and Sprint certainly had tunnels at this time. Even though our T1 to them was native IPv6, upstream here and there, Sprint had infrastructure that didn't support IPv6 at all, and so they'd set up tunnels to get around that. And this caused us problems because he had these sudden drops in, in MTU, and v6 has mechanisms that are supposed to detect this. You have path MTU discovery. However, that didn't always work for us at the time. I think that's partially because our Linux router didn't work so good. Um, OpenBSD, we had, we had firewall rules that dropped the wrong kind of ICMP packets, so fragmentation would break and packets would just fall on the floor. We also had a lot of routing issues. Um, we saw everything from, you know, Sprint would drop routes here and there, but frankly, usually they weren't the problem. We'd see entire countries fall off the network. Uh, you know, they were doing maintenance or whatever, and all of a sudden Finland would be gone. You wouldn't, you wouldn't see them anymore. And they would come back, you know, maybe the next day or the day after that. You'd see the same thing with a lot of corporations. They would just go away, and some of them would be gone for weeks. And it's because nobody noticed, usually. Um, nobody was using this stuff, so it didn't really matter. Um, over the years, service has gotten a lot better. And we actually just retired the Sprint circuit early this year. It served us really, really well. And, you know, things have changed. We're able to get V6 on a lot more circuits, and it just didn't make sense to use this anymore. Uh, but that was our first foray. In 2004, we basically did the Sprint Circuit all over again. The reason why we did this is we, well, VentSurf offered it to us. Um, that's probably the easiest reason. Uh, we have a data center at Equidex out in Ashburn, Virginia, and VentSurf, who is somewhat affiliated with Aaron, um, he's right down the road at the time. He was working for MCI, which was part of WorldCom. He had an experimental IPv6 network, and he knew that we were running v6, and he was really interested in getting us to use his network and basically help us test it and, you know, it, it would give them traffic that they could look at. This is very similar to the Sprint network. Uh, the biggest difference is that we used a Cisco 2800 router this time. Um, it just made more sense. And, in fact, we ended up going back later and replacing the Linux box, box with a, a Cisco router as well um, after the Linux box died. Pretty much everything else is the same, though. Uh, we stuck with OpenBSD. It continued to work really well for us. We had the same website, same DNS, same FTP. Um, Still a segregated network. We were really worried about um, security issues, uh, you know, people compromising v6 or bringing down hosts and causing problems on our v4 network. So we just kept everything completely separate. Still had a lot of path MTU discovery issues, had a lot of routing issues. Uh, nothing really changed there. And um, that's really about all there is to say about that network. Um, until we got to here. So I mentioned earlier that we were in IPv we were in Equinix. Um, this is really the WorldCom network. What happened is WorldCom went belly up. I think people remember that. And we had this kind of zombie T1. I think we got billed for it um, for a while, but eventually the bills kind of stopped coming and we got lost in this ether. We wanted to keep the service up. We kind of been using it as a DR site for, our v for, for IPv6. And around the same time, Equinix started the Equi6IX, which was an experimental IPv6 exchange. Talked to some people at Aaron meetings and Nanogs and stuff like that, and we figured out we could join that, and it was free at the time for any comer since it was in beta. All we had to do was pay for a cross-connect. And we could get transit via an organization called OCAID. OCAID was kind of an IPv6 evangelical place. I think it's still around today, and they'll provide transit to any network um, via tunnels or natively if you can get to them. And um, I think you have to be an ISP or an enterprise. There's an agreement you have to sign. 
but it's a pretty good deal. Um, it's a lot like HENet today or GoGo6 or Sixes and some of these other tunnel brokers. They'll do very similar things for you. Um, that, however, they will offer native traffic if you can get to them on an exchange somewhere, which is pretty cool. Stuck with the same Cisco router. It was a 28, I think it was a 2811. Um, an open BSD firewall. Same website. The biggest difference now is that we, we felt like since we had good v6 connectivity for this first time, that we added a quad A for www.aaron.net. And this proved to actually be kind of a, a neat thing. It meant that people finally noticed that they could no longer get to Aaron and started emailing us. And this led to an opportunity to help people figure out why their V6 was broken. You know, you have to understand that we don't make money from our website. You know, we aren't Google and we aren't Facebook and places like that. So having a quad A associated with our main website really was kind of an alarm bell for people. You know, our, our people that come to our website are usually ISPs or other networks. And when they notice that things are broken, they do what they normally do with us. They email hostmaster at Aaron.net and they say, hey, your website is down. We say, oh, no, it's not. It looks like your V6 is broken. And that would lead into this whole conversation on, between my department and their ops department. And we'd figure out what was wrong between us and them. Sometimes it was, it was them. Sometimes it was us. Usually it was somewhere in between. And we could get a filter lifted or figure out where there's a tunnel or a routing issue and get all of that fixed. So by, by having a quad A for www.net, .aaron.net, we were able to actually make service better for a lot of people and I think educate, which was really, really cool. Um, I think it was the first time that my department really got involved with helping customers troubleshoot their network. This is also the first time that we started to play with dual stack. Um, because we had a 100 megabit ethernet connection into the V6 internet, we were really interested in getting away from, from the uh, segregated network. It made pushes really hard. It made everything really hard. We had to have these weird bastion hosts that had v4 and v6 and we could kind of push stuff and hold it there and then push it over later. We wanted to get away from that. And we really wanted to get some hosts that had access to this great 100 megabit v6 circuit. So we started a dual stack very slowly. Uh, the slow rollout ended up v6 on our entire backbone after about a year. I think by the end of 2007 we had v6 across our entire backbone. And in 2008, we finally rolled V6 over to our client network where we had hosts on the network. Um, this included Windows XP hosts and Linux boxes, Macs. Basically, we got to the point because of this network and how well it worked where we were deploying V6 everywhere we could in a dual stack, stack configuration. And that led to these networks where they were dual stack by default. Um, basically what these networks were, there's two separate networks here. One was um, powered by NTT, the other one was powered by Tiskly at the time, which is now TINet. These were Aaron's next generation public facing services networks. Basically what these networks were, were uh, the home for all of our public facing stuff. So the, the DNS, all of the slash eight internet, our ARPA stuff, the Aaron.net zones, the Whois clusters, um, the internet routing registry, and eventually a lot more, list mail servers, web servers, um, just about everything that, that you can get to over the public we were placing on these networks. So I mentioned they were dual stack by default. They were completely standalone networks, um, basically stub networks, and we uh, bought all new gear for these things. Um, we used what were fairly new at the time, Cisco ASR routers. Um, I think we used uh, 1004s. Um, it's all gigabit. They worked really, really well. Um, had no problems with those. No firewalls at all. We had load balancers that we put in front of these services. Um, we used foundries at the time. Had some problems with the foundries, to be honest. Uh, V6 support was beta, and for those foundries, V6 support, I think, will be in beta forever. They're no longer, they are not going to release a production version of this software. I think we helped them take it as far as they could. And if you look at their new stuff, it is, uh, it supports v6 far better than these things do but we were able to get things to work um, and while we missed a lot of advanced v6 features there's certainly not parity between what you could do on v4 with these foundries to with what you could do on v6 we were able to get the support that we needed and things worked pretty well these networks are still around today they've seen some upgrades we're getting ready to replace the foundries with newer gear um, that has better v6 support so that we can do things like gslb over v6 and some other stuff um, we're working closely with vendors um, brocade now. They, they bought Foundry and we're working with them on their code to get all of this stuff working. Um, and it's actually been a really good relationship. Um, they really listened to us and it's uh, kind of surprising, but it, it's, it's, it's also cool. Other networks that we've set up over the years are our meeting networks. Aaron has two meetings a year. 
I think John mentioned that earlier, um, where they discussed policy, and we were able to take advantage starting around 2005 of the good V6 connectivity that we had developed at Aaron to 